Welcome to Film Criticism 405. This is a Harvard USC CalArts adjunct class taught through Coursera. And Coursera has given us a lot of freedom for this class, but we're mainly teaching film criticism. Now, one thing I've got to introduce you to is the concept of, we've talked about realism, but its opposite effect is formalism, which is what we talked about when we talked about Sergei Eisenstein, the director of Battleship Potemkin, who we went over a couple of times ago, and how he used montage and how montageism, collecting different shots, is more of a formal quality of cinema, whereas gathering these long takes, if not the whole movie being a long take, like Russian arc or something, then you're saying this is kind of a mode of realism, but then these shots get so unwieldy long that they almost become a point of formalism. And that these shots that are cut up seem to be all in one take and it can be realistic to switch from one picture to another picture as we scan the room when we look i look over there i see a guitar i look over there i see a lamp i'm editing in my head where i look you know so that can be reality too so let's just face it but with classicism we have this idea of of a world that's linear it's like beginning, middle, end, usually. And there's conflicts and closure. There's movement throughout. And the movement, like in a classical book, stays on the character and plot. And in the movie of a classical movie, it's character and plot. But the whole formal considerations and realistic considerations are characterized around. Now, we're going to look at a very specific genre within the classical modern realist formalist camp. And most of these, as I'm looking at them, are actually American films. Not that it's exclusive to America to make these kind of films because genre films do exist. In fact, we're going to be covering the gangster film and you think about that. In Asia, they've got all those films by Ang Lee and John Woo and they've got films by Sweet Hark and you're just thinking they have, you know, Wong Kar Wai, he has gangster films. There's a whole Yakuza-like gangster thing too before Kill Bill and I would like to address Kill Bill later on in this show, and I also would like to talk about some other gangster films on down the line, but this is the first one we're going to discuss, and it's Joseph von Sternberg's Underworld, and I know we've all seen in film school The Musketeers of Pig Alley, that D.W. Griffith short film from 1911-1910, where, where these three guys come sidling up to the side of the picture and get caught in close-up. Well, Underworld comes from that only in the tradition that it's really considered the first surviving crime film. I mean, you could make some case that it's the most important of its silent era of a crime film. That I've seen other gangster films from the silent era, I'd say I have, that I can't come across naming a board of them is kind of sad, but that I do hold a rare film in and of itself, Underworld, which is the one that all other gangster films are based on that come before and after it. The ones that came before it were trying to be it, and the ones that came after it are still doing that. And there's a, there's a lot of changes that happen in this film, except for one thing, though, is it borders on the modern silent era of visual storytelling, but it still has the classical aspect of cutting on movement, having a 180-degree line that you don't cross, otherwise it's like going in and out of the screen, like we saw with Sherlock Jr., you never cross the 180 line when you're filming either because you're on the same side of the screen as the character who's watching, supposedly, and that's where the line goes anyway. So you have to risk this as a filmmaker setting it up, knowing that there's an invisible 180 line, and that's the proscenium, that's what you're shooting through, and that's what they can't move on the other side of because they'd be out of the way of the camera for the most part. Unless you were cheating a reverse shot, which would just mean that you're shooting backwards from the same setup with the other character looking the other way, and then it looks like they're still talking to each other or whatever. But this is Underworld, and what I like about it is there's this really amazing, memorable scene where the gangsters win something, and they get really far, and they get the job done, and then suddenly, as they're celebrating, it's New Year's, and everybody's drinking... Dr tapestries are everywhere and everybody's cheering for the New Year's. The gangsters are, have never felt this venerated ever. They're totally on top of the world. 
and they're called Underworld. They're not really known about. This is kind of an underground film. Joseph von Sternberg, as a director, got his Vaughn from where else, D.W. Griffith. If David W. Griffith had a middle initial, so does Joseph von Sternberg and Eric von Stroheim. That Sternberg is really an echelon of European style and European flair. That he is an American director that will do some interesting things all through his career, but will stake it on his silent era film, Underworld, and another one we'll talk about at some other date, and that's the Docks of New York. There's also Last Command that come in these really expensive Criterion box sets that when they put out silent films for Criterion, I come running, man. I know that it's a good one to get. And this one took a while to come out, but we were all there when it did, and it's, it's uh, black and white, and it's silent film. Now, one thing you've got to remember about Joseph von Sternberg is he used a lot of soft focus, a lot of decor that looks symmetrical, although it's expressionistic, that his immersion in the underworld is so comfortable to us to see these well-to-do fitting up gangsters. But some of the scenes do come down to shootouts, and though there is no sound in this, you can still get the sense that the gun violence is prevalent in the gangster film. Somewhat as even an idea of entertainment, which is already so debauched by the board and censors and everything that they're saying movies like this won't continue in the sound era. Now, if I told you that the only way we get into the sound era isn't just because Westerns are looking to get sound and musicals already came out and they sound great, but now we can make gangster films sound freaking good. And it's funny because Underworld was really the one that pushed for there to really be a genre for the gangster film in America, which is interesting because there wasn't much else out in the silent era that established the gangster genre. There was Musketeers of Pig Alley. There were other things too going on. You know, even some of the German films that had like aspects of the Gollum where they stuck the scroll in his head. I mean, that's like having your own robot be your bodyguard gangster friend. But that's not what we're getting into here. We're getting into the classical genre. And these are the Prohibition era gangsters. And really, Little Caesar is important because it has a martyrdom in it of the main character, which is a spoiler alert. But it's the most amazing, most infamous, most led up to, most foreshadowed martyrdom of any gangster ever. And they made that whole film just to be commemoration of the martyrdom of the gangster Little Caesar. But the public enemy is what we're here to talk about. And I don't mean just the hip-hop group that did Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing score. I mean the one with Cagney. And Cagney puts that grapefruit so far in her mouth that it looks like the actors didn't stage it, but actually it was the woman in him that came up with the gag and wanted it in the movie to have him look vicious. And censorship almost took it out. Now, what you got to understand about Little Caesar and Public Enemy is that they came at a time when there was censorship, but censorship codes had just broken the wave because now they're going to replace it with a production code. And a production code has to take a seal from the Legion of Decency, which is run by the church. So now the church is coming into film where they have from 1930 to 1934 to make all the ditch efforts of all the films they want that won't get censored. I mean, in this time you got ecstasy with with, uh, you know, uh, an actress being naked in it. And you've got these movies like Public Enemy and you've got Little Caesar and there's other ones too. We're going to go over Scarface. And those were the main three that I wanted to go over because they're the ones that established the classical Hollywood gangster film and gave it the iconography of guns and suits and going places and big cars and finding women and partying at clubs and being the rat pack and all those things we get to do when we're rich gangsters. And it sure is hard to be a gangster. And there's a lot of things about these films that show the ups and downs of not just that life, but about how hard it would be to live under the constant auspices that, that, that there's people out to get you or you have to get them first. And I think what's interesting about the production code administration coming out in 1934 was it didn't stop these big budget films, Freaks being one of them, which collapsed at the box office. And Hedy Lamarr was the one in ecstasy. And they were doing these films that would totally debauch any censorship, even today, it would be look bad. And they were doing it anyway because they had four years off code. I mean, how wild is that? 
Only Hollywood's like, well, we got four years off code. Let's make all those Prohibition era films. They'll ring true right now because we're having trouble even seeing if the Jazz Aid's going on or if there's a Great Depression, which, by the way, if you're if there's ever a Great Depression, I order TCM to play Gold Diggers in 1933, the movie. And James Cagney's so beautiful in this. His dialogue, all the sounds, the rat-a-tat-tat of the guns, the, the rushing of the water into the gutter, you know, the ending, everything about it sounds so beautiful, and the picture's tied in. We can already see these production qualities of classical Hollywood being at the supreme height of aesthetics. And that's when we get to Scarface, because actually, I gotta tell you, there's a remake of this by with Al Pacino, and it's directed by Brian De Palma, and it's written by Oliver Stone. Now, it's a lot like this one, but I like this one better, not just because it's Howard Hughes and Howard Hawks, and all the Paul Mooney being the gangster in the film. I like this one because it's so wild the way they kind of make it a comedy on the one hand, like they'd kind of done with Public Enemy that in some of those grapefruit scenes that backfired. They're going to make it an even more savage comedy in this one, even just so they can push the production code. Now in this one, in New York, they got a hold of the ending and they didn't like the way that the gangster went free. So they had to do one more, they killed him. Well, in New York, they still didn't like the one where they killed him because they needed to take him to prison. So then they take him to prison at the end, and then New York says, no, we want the one where he hangs in prison. But then you can cut the hanging out of the movie because we can't have that. So you can see that this, now that we're hitting 1933 and we're in duck soup zone, that they're throwing everything back at the censor saying, wait, we'll change it in New York just alone. But the rest of them is print stand free if they don't want him getting shot down at the end like the way we went through and filmed it like you said we should then we're just going to show him getting shot at the end and that's the way he probably went down in the legend of the secret of the movie which is that all these gangsters had other names but none of us are going to tell you who they are because we just don't do that in gangster land not even in bonnie and clyde am i going to tell you that their real names are bonnie and clyde but i just like scarface because it has the whole thing where he's into his sister and he's all freaking out over his sister. Uh, you know, that's what causes his whole downfall of his, like, gangster empire. And it's it's kind of a woman in Public Enemy, a, a femme fatale almost, in these precursors to film noir, that these women in their life are dangerous beauty that are constantly getting lured after by other men and that they're falling into disrepair from their lover or their cousin or their brother's gangster activities, then they just watch as supposedly the empire crumbles. And really, this, these kind of films like Casino, in other words, are showing us that these gangster worlds of empires build and collide anyway just in the natural system of the gangster film that the utopia of the gangsters is always at some point to their victory like we see in Underworld. Perhaps some of their victories that weren't sold so off because of how hard it all ended is coming true in these movies like gangster films like Scarface and Public Enemy. And Little Caesar is more like one of those elevator to the gallows movies where you know the closer he gets to the end of the movie the sooner he's going to get executed indecently by some kind of warhammer machine you know he's he's going down because he's getting closer and closer to the edge of his empire crumbling around him now i've got to take a short stop here and i'm going to tell you that these last three are what you would call classical hollywood gangster films they're classic even little caesar they're classically made, they're classically cut, they obey the rules of the 180 line, they obey the rules of movement match on editing, they obey the linearity of beginning, middle, ending. The next ones we're going to go through are somewhat like Underworld in the sense that they take after Underworld, but the first ones we're going to look at are the postmodern gangster films, then we'll go back and look at it, what it means to be the modern gangster film, which we'll get to in a minute. But I know we have a lot, we had a lot to cover, and we've covered pretty good material so far, and I can't disenchant anyone on that theory that we haven't come far already, but we're looking at what makes a gangster film a gangster film, and we've got like, well, there's a crime that's usually going on, and sometimes it's a social issue of what should or should not be a crime, 
committed by the gangster boss who is the lead character, who is sometimes shown from youth, like in Public Enemy, growing up and to be his gangster self because of some circumstance, whether it's good or bad. Then he goes on to start opening a business which keeps doing illegal things, whether it's against the social ethic or to or not. And then he proceeds, and usually in the prohibition case, they're selling alcohol, which in these other ones, they're selling guns sometimes, who knows. And um, the allegiance continues. The gangsters become a sort of, as we'll see in the modernism, like cops for the immigrants that don't have true justice to represent them, so they have these gangsters take care of them and run their own rule and regulation over the people that they take care of. And that's what they talk about in Goodfellas, too. And Goodfellas is one we'll have to talk about at some point, but we have a little bit, but let's face it, we've got two to look at here, and they're postmodern. Now, to be postmodern, that just means that you take the emphasis off of the existential nature of the modernism. If modernism is asking you for a minimalist inquisition into yourself to find truth deducted from fact deducted into the pure atomistic philosophy that something out there gives us meaning and that may only exist within our lifetime, if that's what modernism is about, it's no wonder it jumps all over the place and makes, makes use of classical breakdown of codes. No, that postmodern is only a step away from that, saying, well, we make modern films, we put them in the edge of existentialism. But we also say they're just movies, but we also say that because they're just movies, we're going to make these movies like into great movies. And movies for the sake of movies is really what postmodernism is. It's like saying, we're going to make every gangster film in one and make a new gangster film that looks already like Underworld. And that's what these are kind of like. This first one that I'm going to show you, we've talked about Martin Scorsese, and now we're talking about a really important movie called Mean Streets. And I'm going backwards here and forwards, but you got to understand that Mean Streets is the one that's like, uh, looks like realism, looks like documentary realism, looks like verite, but it is all edited with a strange, sly bit of montage use that Scorsese likes to use even in his deep focus long takes, which makes me realize he's going kind of for this Orson Welles aura about his films early on. That, Who's That Knocking at My Door had been made before Mean Streets, so had Boxcar Bertha. It was Mean Streets that finally put him on the map and pleased uh, uh, all of his other filmmaker friends, like John Cassavetes. It pleased them to know that Martin Scorsese was good at this genre of gangster film, though Martin Scorsese had interest in making other genres. He, too, began to realize, even from Who's That Knocking at My Door, that the gangster film was coming into play, that this could be taken as a modern gangster film shows the loneliness even when togetherness with your friends can strike you and you can be stuck in a case of you're in the middle of the city you're where you need to be you're with who you need to be and you still feel this core sense of isolation loss and loneliness that comes through in these scorsese films like me in streets that there's unexplained moments of violence that there's unexplained moments of pain that there's unexplained moments of religious furor that comes down to religious oppression that there's straight up villainous gangsters that come out of the woodwork. And then there's, there's the not too notorious local thugs that are kind of the local thugs that are in this movie that really don't do anything that bad. And it's kind of on the level of West Side Story from how far they go with their weaponry and exploration of the gangster genre. Martin Scorsese shows in this film at the beginning a clip with Harvey Keitel, who is the main character in this. And he whispers something into the camera soundtrack that says, you don't pay for your sins in the church. You pay for your sins in the street. And everything else is just bullshit. And I think that kind of sets off the whole Martin Scorsese theme, that, like we all want to go to church and pay for our bad deeds, you know, all as Christians, but that we're going to have to go live with the devil to make a movie is just the way it's going to be. I mean, it's no accident that, like, the Italian film that was seen first in our list of films was Inferno, and here we have Mean Streets, and it's the Inferno of the streets, and here's these would otherwise be pleasant characters of Christians that are being torn apart just from the pressures of the city, 
having money and needing money and needing guns and having guns and going to a pool hall, sometimes fight breaks out. A fight breaks out at a pool hall in Mean Streets and it looks like a real brawl. I mean, they must have really done some good choreography on that fight scene. And the fact that there's point of view cams coming in to like rush towards the other people is so beautiful that point of view cams are used in Mean Streets in unique ways that the flash pan, flash forward, and side swipe cam is totally amazing. That all the tricks of, that you see later in Casino are all laid out in Mean Streets completely compatibly with the whole series. The only thing missing is Joe Pesci. <laughs> Joe Pesci didn't come about to a raging bull. That means he had Taxi Driver and Mean Streets off and a couple of others. Well, we'll get to Raging Bull when we're in another era. But right now, i got to finish up on Mean Streets. This, this is a cool review that Kenneth Turan of the Los Angeles Times says. This is a jazzy riff of a movie, a Amer modern American screen classic. So he's calling it modernist. My question is, is, is it really modernist or is it just a tell to show off images or is it a show off of images because that's what you're supposed to do with images, show them off? Or is it a show off of images because it's someone who's so commanding with the image that he knows how to take care of an underworld type remake that's as conclusive as to what it's really about as underworld, even though there's psychologically character studies and a loose plot that in this does go fairly linear, but stops to name the characters as though they're chapters. And that would be something you'd represent in a Godar movie made years before and we're about to talk about the Godard movie made years before. And then we'll get to modernism and modernism and gangster films. And we'll only need a, a few minutes after that to study. So that class will last a little shorter at this moment is true, but that we still have a ways to go is important. So bear with me through a couple more. That the soundtrack to this has rock and roll music like not, on, not unlike American Graffiti, which came out around the same time. Like, don't forget, they were both using scores of soundtracks that were similar to each other's, and they had both come from the, both Scorsese and George Lucas had come from the Woodstock Festival, armed with tons of soundtracks, and they, they kept building and setting soundtrack mode. That This is a good soundtrack, American Graffiti is a good soundtrack. Best year for soundtracks ever, because two of them were the best ever, maybe, but Nashville is probably the best soundtrack to a film. And we'll talk about Nashville when we get to Altman, but that Nashville, just to give you a little hint, they mic'd everybody. The actors themselves had to learn how to sing, learn how to play guitar, and write a hit for the radio before they could be in the movie. And that's how hard it was to be in Nashville. So you can see why when they got good at what they did, like Keith Carradine is winning Oscars for a song he wrote just for the movie to be a country star in the movie, but now he's a real country star because he played in a movie where he had to be a country star in a movie. And this is John Luke Godard's postmodernist, Pierre LeFou. And we could say modern here again. I've heard the word modern used to describe this one, and I raised my hand on that, but the reason I call it postmodern is because really it's existential, but the nature of its existentialism seems playful in almost a Wes Anderson, Moonrise Kingdom kind of way. I don't really get the sense that their dastardly gangsterism, although it is a lovers on the run movie like that goes from once, oh, you only live once in fury all the way to natural born killers. We talked about the gun crazy being in there. We talked about Bonnie and Clyde and Badlands. You know, we talked about that David Lynch one with Wild at Heart, and we talked about California and all those. And that one really comes from Pure de Food. Pure de Food comes from You Only Live Once and Fury, and that there's others before gang, gang, Gun Crazy is true too. And that there's other Lovers on the Run movies that I didn't even name, a true romance and stuff. Yes, we know there's a lot of them, especially in the 90s when they just kept going into that medium. But this is the ultimate one because. It keeps flashing in and out of a musical to a gangster film, for one thing. It's also, like, mundane, everyday type stuff. Like, he's got a babysit. He wants to leave. He goes somewhere. She rides with him. They both turn out to be gangsters. They both go natural-born killer style. Then they both 
end up on some island somewhere and then they both are off the island and then they go back to being gangsters and the whole time they keep going in and out of musical and that there's a musical number in here the longer you watch you'll get one that will blow your mind called my leap shanta and when he reads her fate line dude that is the music of the gods this musical gangster film as you would call it has sequiturs like bugsy malone bro i mean they're just going on the whims of where they can sing and how they can sing and then how they can become gangsters afterwards and what they've got to do and it's interesting that the box is like this but i want to talk about the modernism and the postmodernism. a lot of times when they use jump cuts or cuts or fades or anything like that in a modern film it could be like citizen kane where it's tying two elements together that don't necessarily have a full metaphorical this derision together, but they might have by impounding all the shots together in that way. But with Pierre Lafeu, you get this sense that there's going to be a, it's go dar, it's not going to cost a lot of money, but there's going to be exploding cars, there's going to be like hijinks with shooting, there's going to be like faked out violence stuff, there's going to be like partial nudity, and all this in an exploitation kind of way, but all this in saying, we're French New Wave, and we're going to cut this film forward and backward and make it two different films and make, throw in a third one and call it one thing and then edit it all the schmitherines after that and then put it all back into long sequence if we want. Because that's what Godard and Truffaut were doing back then when they were in the French New Wave and they were conquering the medium and they had all the plans to deploy these films for not very much. So this one was really successful. And that, yes, again, it's Criterion Blu-ray, so it's really hard to find. I mean, maybe that Underworld one was hard to find. Scarface was pretty hard to find. The the TCM box you see with Pro Prohibition Era that had Public Enemy was a little less pricey, but that it had all these other gangster films in it, including Smart Money, which is an interesting one. I'd say the least all of them are worth watching. And Roaring Twenties, look at that, it's Humphrey Bogart. But that was about the only one I could say was found in a store other than Mean Streets, which has been available at some retail factions, but they're really hard to come by and it's not always available. But Pure Le Faux, you pretty much have to special order to get into it. Now why I chose it is because I feel that for some reason the jump cuts this time, whereas they're really modernist sci-fi in Alphaville, the jump cuts this time are like this playful like match on animation type thing or match on musical or red, white, and blue colors or just things that look beautiful about the lead actress or things that make John Paul Belmondo look cool when he's smoking, you know, and that, that they go to the beach at the beginning and there's this beautiful shot of the ocean off to the screen. You see this beautiful shot of the ocean off to the screen. And I, I can't come right now. And there's a beautiful screen of the ocean off to the right and then there's this beautiful beach scenario and you see all the beach laid out and then it's Anna Karina and John Pelt Mondo in character and they just escaped some gangster activity and they're laying there and they probably just you know made love and they're gonna make love again and they're talking about it in poetry and they just were in the car earlier talking about how they're about to make love and none of this makes any sense they're just meet each other once and take off and now they're in love and the the moon is sitting there and they can see the moon and John Pelbo Mondo's all well Americans went to the moon and Russians went to the moon and when the moon people met Americans Americans offered them a Coca-Cola and the Russians offered them communism <laughs> not in that order either <laughs> but anyway then there's that reminds me of the story of the Venusians and Easy Rider but let's move on it's another Tempest of Forbidden Planet Expose, right? But if you move on from Pierre Lafoe to the ending, when everything gets blown up and everything gets in your face and when everybody's dying and everything's collecting and they have to die at this island or they're going to be caught and worse things will happen to them than even waterboarding, which a whole scene of waterboarding in this makes you think that you never want to be waterboarded and I never have it. I've seen that scene several times, seen this movie several times. It's a really fun way to watch movies that they're writing the script and the journal at the same time that he's narrating is true that he narrates some stuff that's as wild as what you'll see in weekend but a little more reserved for the true theocracy of the gangster crowd and i like the ending because even after everything's devastated and gone 
you still hear John Paul Belmondo whispering into the horizon something about how it's just the sea and the stars. And then you hear John, or, or uh, you hear uh, Anna Karina say it's just the stars and the sea. And then you just see the sea. And you'd already seen the stars and the sea. But now you just see the sea and it's just this. And that makes it seem like you're going back to Italy or something because you're going back to the Inferno or wherever you're going after this. Which really, with Godard being so anarchistic, that hell is already on Earth before you leave it, that it was a relief that they died. I'm calling it postmodern because in modern, it's never happy that they die. But if they die, they're not as tormented. But guess what? In modernism, they're tormented even when they die just by being unconscious. It's worse than torment. It's absolute powerlessness. You don't want to go into it. So, and really Pierre Lefeuille makes a journey with it all the way and makes you realize that even after they got blown to smithereens by whatever dynamite they put on their head, it didn't matter because they were still narrating the film. Now, whether they were ghosts narrating the film, I don't know. I don't know what that means, but I think it's a postmodern ending. Now we go into modernism, gangster, and we'll finish up here. This is a movie that's really important to see in your lifetime, no matter who you are, and I rank it up there as one of the most important films for us all to see, and it's The Godfather. Francis Ford Coppola, early in his career, after Rain People, before Apocalypse Now, Marlon Brando's in it. Marlon Brando takes the whole movie on. He's in most of it. It's got every actor you ever wanted. Robert Duvall, James Caan. It's got uh, uh, Al Pacino. You know. And it won Best Picture in 1972, for instance. But what we're here to talk about is The Godfather. And I can get into Godfather 2 some other time, but I'm going to need about... 10 more minutes of your time to talk about The Godfather because it's an important film. What I think is important about it is it started out as a pulp novel film, but it was already in an independent vein to bring back studio system work that could work to be like the other gangster films, like going back all the way to the most influential one, and that's Underworld. And for Underworld and, Little, and Public Enemy to be the most influential gangster films of the classical era, it's not accidental that Godfather takes much of its framing and much of its lighting from the Joseph von Sternberg's underworld as to how they set up the shots that seem too dark to see but can really look really popping good. And I wish I had the Blu-ray of this, but the DVD one looks simply phenomenal as it is. And it's taken a lot to even get this copy because I've lent it out so many times and then it's like, never lend out your copy of Godfather because someone's going to want to just run off of it and it's probably your best friend and that's how they're being gangsta by running off Godfather and then I have to come with my cousin Guido from Palermo looking for him. No, I'm just kidding. Actually, though, that does bring up a good point that the mafia and Godfather is about the Cosa Nostra, the really, the, the Ital Italian Sicilian based like inner city mafia of these big bosses that started off in Italy and then like the Italian Americans after they came across to uh, the Statue of Liberty in New York City and were checked in at the harbor and could become like citizens of that city and then like that crime bosses rose from that city is all talked about more in Godfather 2 but in Godfather 1 there is a scene where Al Pacino has to has to go to he, he kills an important cop played by Sher Sterling Hayden and he has to get deported towards the third, fourth of this movie this happens. Not deported, but hidden in Italy, where he marries another wife, not to Diane Keaton's knowing, which secretly we think is to her disliking, because she can't help but think she somehow knows something was going wrong in Italy that she should know about. And but Diane Keaton's kind of the mismatch of this whole movie is weird, because... You know, the godfather, Marlon Brando, he really likes Diane Keaton, wants her to get married to Al Pacino, wants them to be happy together, but he really doesn't want her to get messed in with gangster affairs. Now, for Al Pacino to have to come and take over the family is a surprise because he went to the army not knowing that he would one day take over the family, but somehow it's all rooted into the theory of the film that Al Pacino would have known that once the godfather passed, it would have been Al Pacino to take his 
Corleone father's place as the godfather, and that's why at the end of this movie, Al Pacino is becoming a godfather or a, or a parent at baptism that is eliminating the devil. Now that when he touches the holy water and eliminates the devil, it reminds me of the fact that, that the gangsters in the scenes that are being Eisenstein and Pravkin back and forth and Kuleshov back and forth are this montage of these gangsters at the end of the film that were all big gangster roles in a behind the scenes underworld where they talk to Brando about making and breaking rules, but that since they keep trying to kill Brando and his kids, they're all whacked out at the same time. It seems like that the baptism is going on for Al Pacino. Now, if Al Pacino is getting, getting a baptism and the five fathers are getting wasted, we know it's Brando's soldiers doing the wasting of the five fathers like he said he would if any more of his kids died which they were threatened, and at this point, we still don't know that Frito, one of his sons, is causing trouble, too. It kind of ends with a foreshadowing that Frito is going to throw everything out, too. But now, let's go back from the beginning and go into the opening. Now, we've already got this music that is Nino Rota, and it's so beautiful. It's like Francis Ford Coppola's dad helped compose some of it. I mean, it's just like for these movies and helped do the... the con composing and the conducting of the symphony and everything and it's so beautiful to think that these movies can have such beautiful music and look and that it was on a runaway budget even though they had just come from Roger Corman Studios in 68 with Dementia 13 and now they're already making this high cloud movie that the budget keeps getting bigger and bigger that the time it's going to take to make it gets longer and the time it gets bigger and bigger is not something that's cursing at this time Films like that had, often, had sometimes ran amok and gone completely scale wall forgotten. But The Godfather leaned on it that it was worth the risk. Coppola writing script rewrite after script rewrite. I heard he had to write five different versions of the same script, and only then did he get the version he needed out of a scattered choice of all the scripts. That he was writing it all the time is true, that he was basing it on Mario Puzo is true, that he shot it like the underworld and scored it like a jazz, never been done before situation, that all these actors were in it, were all method actors and had to be trained by a really strict school of acting and Marlon Brando had already originated method acting, going back to Streetcar Named Desire and in, on the waterfront even before that. Brando was a method actor, and just a review on method acting, it's social realism and theatrical realism. Social realism and theatrical realism and documentary realism all feed into the same idea of method, methodical filming, and methodical acting. The idea of methodical filming is I'm filming everything that's going on, shooting it like a documentary, kind of like Mean Streets was like, or Pierre de Faux in a sense. But don't forget, though, the illusion of The Godfather to be one of these films, to be completely in sync with the gangster film, does have all the myth convention of iconography of the classical film. Does, in fact, have the shootouts that you would expect to see that were crazy, like in Public Enemy. Does have a lot less in censorship bounds, and so when you see the fathers get whacked or other violent acts or one of their guys get strangled or these are really intense special effects they're doing to show off what they can do with filmmaking but in Godfather I get the sense that it's modernist because it's existential because the loss and pain and trauma and isolation and all the things you go through in a characteristically modernist world don't make you necessarily want to laugh and go run and watch the film again, but you do want to watch the film again to bring everyone back, set up the pieces again, and watch the pieces get destroyed one by one. Although, in some ways, it's such a beautiful apocalypse. It's elegant to see how this stack of dominoes falls. And that, I sit here and think, the method acting, the social, psychological realism, that they would have had to have worked with gangsters? Well, they don't really talk about that in Hollywood films. Sometimes Scorsese says, yeah, Miss Greenrider was really a gangster. 
And sometimes Coppola says, yeah, I've really known a couple of gangsters. Nobody really talks about it. I'm not going to sit here and say, well, Coppola and Scorsese are a couple of gangsters. In one sense, and they are in the sense that they're maverick film directors and that they are rebels, yes, and that they do cinema for the sake of cinema, yes, but that they're gangsters in the sense of, like, I joined the mafia to protect me. Um, maybe. I wouldn't make any gossip either way about that. That's not for anyone to know, but if they did have protection from gangsters, I wouldn't doubt it that they'd be gladly be protected by gangsters, but that they have Hollywood uh, bouncers means they're probably teamsters, which aren't really gangsters, but then except in that sense that you say all teamsters are gangsters in a kind of flattering way with now's today's style of saying you're a gangster because you're a nice guy and you helped us out. And that there is a good quality of being a gangster that didn't really come from Pierre Lafoe, which thinks gangsterism can be kind of down hard and sleazy, but also kind of gets in the way of making love when we want to. And that here, gangsterism, isn't it totally made to look like it's the greatest option either? In fact, in all of these films, there's kind of, a, except for maybe Underworld, there's, even then, there's, an under, there's a kind of undercurrent that these films don't lead to a very good lifestyle, except maybe Underworld. But what's interesting is, is the one that makes the gangster films everyone want to be a gangster is Godfather. And it's the only one none of us will admit that we do not want to be one of the characters in The Godfather. Because by the time we get to Godfather 3, we're going to be so blinced out by the ending that when the Pope dies in Godfather 3, after the big gun battle at the orchestra house and the opera house, then we see that we truly wouldn't, from Italy in the early days to Italy, when Al Pacino was sent back in the first one, to the docks of New York, to the seemingly unforgivable occurrences where we have to take down mob bosses, I am telling you, especially in Godfather 1, like when they're moving around the body of Brando, who's about to die, his sons are. And I'm telling you, no one would want to be these gangsters. But these guys are portrayals of these gangsters. And so I'm not going to sit around and say everyone's a gangster. Or you should all be gangsters or we should all be gangsters. But gangster films have such a rich body of dilemma and flesh to them and story and subject matter and that you can have romantic interest although it can lean misogynistic even with the film fatale and you can kind of have these legends of true gangster stories that are kind of like made even truer or less true or flashier or however you want to do it you can fling around the soundtrack you know since the these early like public enemy the rat-a-tat-tat -tat of of these Tommy guns, you know, you really get into that effect with those guns and how people are taken down and the sound effects and twisting and then going from when they're kids to when they're adults like they do it again in the modernist Goodfellas, which Goodfellas kind of has that ending that you wouldn't want to be a gangster, really, if that's how you ended up. But a lot of them have that ending, but it's weird because even though Godfather has the most venerated ending and they're all kind of really functioning and they're all kind of doing the right thing they're still been through so much isn't it since the time they cut off the horse's head in hollywood and even way before the godfather one even starts there's a backstory that you start to gather and that there's time in italy even before that in godfather two so needing to be stated but that you can make these adventures and delicious like patterns of movie making and myth making and that you can kind of unfold the story by doing the same thing musketeers pig alley was doing that there's these three sharp dressed gunsmen coming right up to the camera and because it's a formal consideration that they get up too close they look right at the camera and that just shows that the formal considerations were like these are the gangsters these are what's coming to cinema as soon as we get sound we're going to take Underworld to the next step. <laughs> Underworld will be made still, but we're taking Underworld to the next step and dividing it over with uh, 
every gangster film since. And that Godfather is the truest underworld is probably its most really point about why it's the greatest gangster film of all time. Because underworld is the most influential, but that Godfather is so true to underworld, even though Godfather is an indie film break out of its own, that's going to be heralding in all these blockbusters later, like Exorcist and Jaws and whatnot that's coming out. And it's sweeping the theater for these magnificent scoped epics that are bringing people to the theater anyway for these glorious visions. And that everybody, when The Godfather came out, had to go and see it. And that papers said it's culturally significant. And it's still culturally significant. It's great. But that it follows Underworld's storyline and lesser consequences do befall Godfather and company than the villains. Which oftentimes in gangster films, everybody gets destroyed. I find it interesting that there's still that actually the Godfather pretty much dies of natural causes. As much as, it, spoiler alert, well, I mean that he was taken out of the hospital and put back in when he almost died. It was a scary scene because it's like, how vulnerable can you get? But when he's alone with a grandkid or something, he just wanders off and kind of kills over in his own orchard. And you're thinking, well, at least he died a noble way. It's still natural causes and you, but I will say this, the existential loss and heartache, not just because you wouldn't want to be the gangster film characters, and maybe you wouldn't. Maybe I said that too astutely because there's been times I've wanted to think I was all gangster, but not really like be a gangster, you know. That's like the problem with the, the statement in general. But um, that Marlon Brando does die of natural causes is interesting because the Godfather doesn't necessarily say you should be a gangster. It's just the ultimate aesthetic of the gangster film showing why we love gangster movies, but I call it modern because I'm always usually left with a really sad taste in my mouth after the ending of all the Godfathers and how they end. And it isn't just because in part two he closes the door on his wife and what my professor, Dr. Boyd, says is the coldest shot in all of cinema history, right? At USC, he says that. <laughs> when he clo when Al Pacino closes the door on Diane Keaton, <laughs> and when she's at the door yelling, I was like, that is a cold, isolated scene. But there's other things, too, besides the good fellow's instinct of that, to say it's always the woman that's bringing us to the low points, even in the... Scarface remake where it's really women's fault that we have to go to Texas Chainsaw Massacre and blow up a whole casino full of, you know, drugs everywhere or whatever and machine guns. It's like the overplay of what's already overplayed in Scarface is remade into this kind of postmodern jumble and you do feel kind of coming out of Scarface like you just lived the diehard version of the gangster like, I'm going to be a gangster now, where's my chainsaw, you know, and you're making jokes, of course. Because when we look up to the, our actors and stars in movies as heroes or anti-heroes, we, we want to be like them, but only in, only in like some of the things we say and only in some of how we act. We don't want to really be this brutish, proto-fascist source of like, buy my liquor or I'll whack you type way. You know, we want to be like, so lady, how are you doing tonight? Or whatever, you know, there's other ways of adapting these characteristics that we're learning from just because it's in a classical way. Now, Godfather is kind of, Edited as though there's sonography that matches up with montage, but the sonography is mostly following scenes to sequences, and that sequences are building up is how, like, the play out of each sequence is so sweeping that you get every characteristic of the A to Z, a, a mid, beginning, middle, and end story. And that there's a lot of conflict resolution throughout, only keeps you going through and saying there's got to be a big conflict resolution. Now that it ends on the side of the gangsters, maybe. But that isolation, pain, and loss, and despair is in every frame of The Godfather, and that you may really think this is another one of those endurance testers is only because they'll be kicking yourself that you haven't seen it yet. And that's why it's one of the films in this class that I'm making it criteria I know, you're going to boo me. I'm making it criteria to watch all of The Godfather Part 1. Now, at USC, they'd make you watch Part 1 and Part 2, but I'm going to wait to make you watch Part 2 till another class or something because there's so much going on and there's so much history of film and we could have gotten so much more into, like, 
why there are guns in the gangster film and what the gun play is like in reality and why we don't necessarily know what to do with like street weapons and New York doesn't even allow guns and now there's this whole thing about like well Mean Streets has a gun on the cover and you know that gun and Pierre Lafoe has this big gun on the cover and we all know that there's guns in Underworld and that there's guns in these gangster films but what I find interesting is is that there's guns in westerns too but we always think of them as the heroes gunning down the anti-hero which in so many westerns isn't even the case it's, but the usual contrivance of the classical Western is the good guys win. Well, in the gangster film, the character is ambiguous. He's partly good and partly evil. He's beyond good and evil. The gun is like his shepherd, as they say in Pulp Fiction. Pulp Fiction has the best way of explaining what the icon of the gun is. It's the shepherd. And by that, it points to which way everybody should go or the camera should be aimed in. Then if it's supposed to be taken as a real gun, it points in the direction that it's shooting at. And then... There's a cut, too, that matches the fall. And in Sam Peckinpah movies, when they're falling off a cliff and they've been shot off the cliff and they start falling, it cuts back to the shooter or some other clip nearby him or down to the ground anywhere, non-diegetic in a Pierre Lafoe kind of way, jet smash cut, then back to the dude falling again, and then back to the other scenery. So we don't even have to hear the guy hit the ground. We just see him slow-mo following, falling, in like scenes that would have taken longer than that, that because of how they're edited, even in ways that Pierre Lafoe is still experimenting with, even in ways that Sherlock Jr. we talked about is experimenting with. So I don't know if it's really the gangster film's ideal to leave behind a feeling like that was sad or that was devastating or that was depression, but devastating maybe, but only in the sense that you just endured and tolerated some of the wildest, purposefully against censorship sequences, purposefully down dirty dogs type attitude in the films. And then everything from the Tommy gun at the bowling alley in Scarface down to the, like I said, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre stuff in the remake of Scarface. To the romantic relationships that never work out in gangster films and always cause something to go wrong and always cause everybody's downfall is somehow usually tied to romance and which isn't always the case in Godfather except for Diane Keaton, we have to admit, was kind of thrown into that snake pit of like, well, she'll be a great actress, but now she's got to be the chick that we're all running out on because she's bringing us down now. But we liked you two having a good marriage at first. Even though you're Italian and she's American. So we question these things in gangster films too. The Paul Mooney one, the Underworld, we're already getting on the edge of like prohibition coming in, and suddenly it's like, we're still gangsters, we're still gonna drink, we're still gonna go around and slam in cars, and we're gonna run the party scene. That's what we're gonna do. But I think the reason I do love Pierre Le Fou and Main Streets. Is because for all those things that still exist that are done in poor taste, that are exploited qualities of gangster films, these two take those qualities the most and spread it out and stretch it out into these movies about movie making that we'll see with Pulp Fiction again is doing with movies about movie making. That these Pierre Le Fou, PF, Pulp Fiction, I mean, these movies have a lot to do with Pulp Fiction and why Pulp Fiction is the way it is. It's colorful, it's splashy, they're dicey, they're colorful, they're splashy, they're dicey. This is the only one I can say that I'm going to recommend to you and that it does have kind of a classical overlap of not really being able to tell how it's made. If you study it real close, you can learn how to make a really epic movie and for under budget, well, even more so saying than Star Wars, they didn't know it was going to be as big of a hit as it did. Now that it's one of the most successful movies of all time, well, it's always on, it's always usually mentioned on the American Film Institute's list of one of the best films, if not the best film of all time. And so I'm going to say good night for now. You've learned a lot. We talked about the gangster film. We didn't really get into the whole idea that they're 
policing themselves. We didn't really get into the idea of how they fit politically with like Cuba or like New York or immigration or becoming an Italian American into an American. We could look at how the scenes move ecstatically forward in the classical let's misbehave with the production code style, but that the Godfather seamlessly roller, rollers you through the whole thing like a Hitchcock is so beautiful. It's like Corman and Hitchcock trained Coppola or something just from him watching their movies. And everything goes so perfect in that film that it gives a whole new meaning to the word flawless masterpiece.